her great sense of humor, her dedication to helping students, and her passion in serving the Latino community in the north end of Springfield, Professor Marie Holland challenges us as students at Elms College to not only think and reflect about the issues affecting our society, but to be agents of change. Marie Holland is an Elms College graduate, class of 1985, where she majored in social work and Spanish. She then pursued a master's in social work at Springfield College. For over 25 years, Maureen Holland worked at New North Citizens Council, a community-based organization which advocates for residents in the north end of Springfield, Massachusetts, as well as providing social services to the Latino community. Among the many projects, she worked closely with maternal programming and childhood daycare. Maureen Holland's work has been dedicated to addressing the need for Latinas having greater leadership opportunities in the area of social services as well as promoting diversity in leadership. Maureen Holland is definitely a Latina at heart and shares a special passion for Latin America as she has traveled to various regions in that region. She lived in Colombia, oh, yeah. where, she taught, where she taught in elementary school as well as worked in an orphanage. Just this past month, she served as a chaperone for the Elms Mission trip to Nicaragua. <laughs> Currently, Marie Holland serves as the director of the social work program at Elms College and teaches various courses, her favorite being social work practice with the community. She's a fan of the show, there's Jackie. She loves to travel and finds that Swedish fish to be a remedy for everything. She shares a deep love for dance, and on her free time, she enjoys arranging flowers and reading good books. Let us welcome Prof Professor Marie Holland as she explores ways of finding sunshine on a cloudy day. Professor Marie Holland. about today is finding sunshine on a cloudy day. And today I want to address primarily the students of Elms College, but other schools too I know are here. So first of all, what are your majors? Call them out. Social work. Social work, Social work what else? Education. Education. Medicine. Medicine, criminal justice, what else? Nursing. What was that, nursing, what else? Sports management. Sports management. Sports management. Psych. Healthcare management. Healthcare management. Spanish. 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 All right, great. That's good. So, I am frequently struck that many of you have chosen to study for careers that expose you to heavy doses of human misery. Right now, some of you are learning about misery in the pages of your books and through films, maybe through some models, and in YouTube videos. As you progress in your studies, you will move into hospitals, classrooms, community settings, all kinds of institutions, and sometimes street corners. You will see things that it will be hard, and it will be sad, and you will see thick clouds of misery and despair. Isn't this uplifting? <laughs> you will see people throughout the lifespan, from pregnancy, through birth, early childhood, childhood, young adulthood, middle adulthood, old age, and death. You will see people who are experiencing great stress, and that stress that other people are experiencing will be hard for you sometimes. Now, my remarks are not just for students in the helping professions. For example, liberal arts students study human suffering and create works of art and readings and new ways of thinking to inform our craft, our helping, and our skills. 
Business students, is anyone a business student? Business students will work to build jobs and income for families to support their children. <coughs> One thing that I noticed when we sat here a few months ago and watched the Pope address Congress, he had a shout out to business people, which I thought was very amazing, and talked about how important business is in helping to build the economy to bring income to families. Sometimes things will not go well, and there will be bankruptcies, and layoffs and disappointments. All of you, no matter what your major is, no matter what your job is, will touch people directly in your personal lives. So your community, community engagement, your, your work with family, friends, we are all in the business of being witness to and observing human suffering. We will do the best we can, but sometimes we will wear ourselves out. And when we do, we cannot see much sun to shine through those thick clouds. I have been a social worker pretty much all of my life. As a student, I worked at a homeless shelter. I look back with disbelief. I would kill my kids if they did this in college. I was sometimes alone with 12 homeless women and children all night long, alone. I remember one woman who had a seizure when she woke up every morning. It was just part of the routine. Most of the residents were abusing substances and battling for mental health. Surely there were a lot of clouds. But their strengths, their humor, their fun, their improvements, were rays of sunshine for me. I really loved it there. I worked for a time in South America, somewhat, somewhat informally, as a volunteer in an orphanage. Most of the children had parents, but they were too poor or unavailable to care for their children. No one assigned me to go there. I sort of found it and stayed there. There were no services little expert care. I will always remember one little baby named Lucia, who was quite disabled from syphilis that she obtained from her mother when she was a fetus. She was kept mostly in a dark room. They encouraged me to not pick her up because she began to understand that there were humans in the world and she liked the human contact but it was a burden on the staff to have a baby beginning to cry. Several of the children in the orphanage could not walk and had a myriad of seemingly undiagnosed and untreated disabilities. I remember one child, a boy, who was probably about 12, who was a big kid, was curled in a fetal position in a bed almost all of the time. I was shocked one day when his biological mother came to visit. He stood up and crossed the room and hugged her. When she left, he returned to the bed and back to the fetal position. Despite the difficult circumstances of that or orphanage, I found a lot of children who had moments of joy and genuine love from those who cared for them. I was happy there. I found sunshine and strength there on many days. I later worked for several years as a child abuse investigator in a very poor neighborhood. Each month, I would investigate 18 cases of child abuse where it was suspected. It wasn't always true. However, I had children who died or were maimed from things like shaken baby syndrome. I worked with youth who were burned intentionally with cigarettes or irons. One child was so neglected she thought her name was Kid. The sexual abuse cases were particularly intense and never seemed to shed all of its secrets. I loved that job. Sometimes it was a little harder to see sunshine among the clouds, but I managed to find it because I looked closely at my clients and I found their strengths. 
I found the little teeny pieces of sunshine that were in with them and helped them to recognize them and to build on them. My clients grew from that. Next, I moved to my beloved neighborhood, the north end of Springfield. It contains within its borders the poorest census tract in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You can read about the community anytime you want with its high dropout rates, remarkable HIV statistics, asthma, mold in the schools, lead poisoning, teen pregnancy, the numbers are all bad. I remember lots of deaths from AIDS, drugs, violence, chronic illness, and despair. There was a lot of pain, but there was a lot of strength in the neighbors. I saw their strength, and I sought their sunshine. Part of my practice was pointing out their strengths and building on them. People want to build on what they have, what is strong in them. That helps them to change their lives. I was happy there. I've never left social work practice, even as a professor. Right now, I spend a few hours a week helping an agency that works with battered women to implement a federal grant. What is this project? It serves children whose parental relationship is so dangerous that they cannot all be in the same room together. Trained visit monitors sit with the children or the child and the non-custodial parent to assure the safety of all. In this agency, tales of rape, shattered faces, and officially changed identities result from intimate partner violence, not from a James Bond movie. Although it is early in my work there, and it is only a few hours a week, I love it there. How can you find goodness, find sunshine, in such difficult work settings or in life itself? Because many of you are going to be doing the same work that I'm doing, just in a different setting. I suggest a few things. I co-authored a study about identifying strengths in poor neighborhoods a few years ago. My co-investigators and I asked professionals in Western Mass mostly who worked in poor communities to identify some of the strengths in these poor neighborhoods. Let me tell you, it took a while because many of us can spout off very interesting and impressive statistics about infant mortality, drug arrests, and mass incarceration of people of color in our prison systems. Once the workers sat quietly for a few minutes, they shared a lot. One interviewee couldn't name anything positive. It was a short conversation. However, most of the workers in the poor communities, upon reflection, found strengths in the communities. They found little bits of sunshine. One physician who frequently does home visits mentioned something so simple. It was the green oasis of lawn at the nearby Catholic church. It was well tended and children loved to run through it. I drove by that church all the time. I never noticed it. I never noticed the green lawn. It took someone to look for those strengths, to look for that sunshine. Another professional described the tenement buildings where people would organize to help other neighbors in need. An unexpected funeral expense, very commonly by the way, would prompt neighbors to cook and sell food to raise money. Some shopkeepers would allow a jar to be placed at the checkout counter, counter to collect money for burial funds for the family with the unexpected and surely unbudgeted loss. Other professionals named the neighbors who would watch out for neighborhood children. Several mentioned the storefront churches, not the big churches, the little storefront churches that used to be a hardware store. 
where the members would strive to get jobs for the young unemployed members of their fledgling congregations. Also, the domino games, the baseball teams, the neighborhood gatherings. <coughs> these people, these neighbors, and their efforts to form community, where life is sometimes a bit scary, little bits of sunshine shine through very thick clouds. When I look back at many of these experiences that I've had, and that people talked with me through this research, I recall thick clouds, but I have learned, but continue to relearn, the discipline of looking for the strengths in my clients. The strengths are like little rays of sunshine. Sometimes I'm convinced that God is sending those little rays of sunshine to remind each of us of his constant presence in very cloudy lives. I recently, recently reflected that many of the experience that I have had as a professional social worker or just through organizations that I've affiliated with have been organized by people of faith, often, maybe only, by people who did not have lofty positions in the church hierarchy. The shelter that I staffed as a volunteer when I was your age during my college years were started by two religious sisters who may have made up their own community. I never could figure it out. It ran on volunteer labor and stands today as a well-established organization. Sometime in my early parenting days, I was talked into becoming the president of the Gray House. Many of you know the Gray House. Most of, your, most of the people that have been affiliated with the Gray House are simple people like you and like me. This is a neighborhood organization started by five sisters of St. Joseph who scraped together $500 to build a burnt up, not very good looking building at auction. They could see the sunshine shining through the burnt out building that only had a small chance of rehabilitation. It stands today well more than 30 years later. In South America, my beloved orphanage, the Nino Nino Jesus, was run by an emerging religious order. I think they made things up as they went along. I'm not sure where they are now, or really where the orphanage is, but they were the only people around who were able to organize themselves to care for these kids. They managed to find strength in these abandoned, disabled children and form a loving community for them. Most recently, I made my second trip to Nicaragua with some of you to Amigos for Christ. I'm bringing some more units here. This is a little bit of a commercial. <laughs> this is what I would call a base Christian community run by lay Catholics and their friends as an enthusiastic response to Nicaraguans who live on $2 per day. The staff and the founders are mostly fun, young Americans who leave the U.S. behind to respond to a faithful call to serve others. Again, this is not a formal religious organization. It is not a powerful arm of the Catholic Church or any other church. It is a parish community who wanted to extend their definition of neighbor from Georgia to Chinandega. They are like-minded people who are innovative and forward-thinking. They certainly find sunshine and strength in a community of truly remarkable poverty. When your career, like mine, is illustrated and narrated by human misery, human suffering, how do you find sunshine on a cloudy day? I mean, a thick, cold, blustery, cloudy day. So I've hinted at them, but I'll offer you two solutions. The first is a social work perspective, which has been adapted to many other professions and was popularized by Dennis Salaby. The essential point, and I really bought this, I really believe this, 
is to adjust your perspective away from the medical model, the pathology model, which actually social work learned from medicine, which sees only the abuse, only the defined illness, only the demographics of a torn up neighborhood, the hopeless statistics. I encourage you not to use rose colored glasses. That doesn't make any sense. See the problems with clear, critical eyes. Be clear headed, be realistic, but address the problems by finding the inklings of a solution, by looking for the sunshine, by looking for the strength that each client is going to bring to you. Find out what is working in this family. Find out what is working well for this individual and find a couple of good things that are going on in the neighborhood. These rays of sunshine are the building blocks upon which you can resolve difficulties to move towards individual and social change. Look for sunshine, look for strengths. The second thing which follows looking for strengths among the troubles of others is to practice self-care. Many of you have been instructed in self-care in your, in your reading and in some of the courses that you take. I have come late to this idea of self-care, but I believe in it. Self-care is the nurturing and preservation of yourself. To make yourself strong in order to be an instrument of change in God's cloudy and complicated world. For most of us, the instrument of change that we're going to offer our patients and our clients is ourself, is our relationship, our connectedness with people. If we're not in good shape, we're not going to be a sharp instrument. We need to keep ourselves in good shape. Black McCullough wrote about self-care. To me, it was a way to build resistance to bullshit, disappointment, and a bit of depression. A way to ward off uncertainty. But I've learned along the way that this is impossible. You are never gonna be consistently happy, and you can't prevent sadness or life from running its course. Self-care is a way to at least strengthen yourself, <coughs> to find some inner core so that you are ready when life comes at you. I advise you to practice self-care, not only when the going gets rough. Make your core strong now so that you can buffet against the winds of midterms, finals, forms, finances, romantic disappointments, family problems. Find strength in yourself now, and it'll make you stronger later. Find some sunshine and store it up. Don't wait. This will make finding sunshine on a very difficult day a little bit easier to do. So I have suggested that strength is important I believe that God gives us strength, but it is shrouded. It is bundled in the human misery we encounter and that many of you have chosen to, to work with as a profession. Just like the sun is stronger than the clouds, you sometimes have to search the sky for the sun or wait a little while for it to come back out. There is sunshine, there is strength in human misery. You will see it. You will see it warming you and giving you strength. This will give you strength for the next patient, the next client, the next customer, the next sports management client that you may encounter. Besides finding strength in your difficult work, keep yourself strong, nurture yourself, care for yourself. You are the instrument of change in the world. The instrument must be strong and ready for the long challenges ahead. Seek God's help and make yourself stronger all of the time. This will make you more resilient and make the cloudy days better. The sun is strong. 
Look for the strengths. Look for the strengths in your clients. Look for the strengths in yourself. For you and your clients and your patients are worthy of change and eager for change, wanting to build on those strengths. Make it a discipline, a part of your mind and your spirit, to seek sunshine on a cloudy day. You go to the gym. Great. Very good. What else? You say no sometimes. Saying no sometimes? <laughs> really? Do you want to talk about that, Miss Therapist? <laughs> Saying no sometimes. It's good. Yes, back there. Of course, I'm afraid, but I like to talk to myself. I like to myself up and my mouth up and down. Good. So I do want to say that I do believe I was never taught self-care. I was telling some of the people here, I discovered self-care because I had to give a talk about it. And I went, it was a national conference, it was kind of a fancy thing, and I had a friend who, that's her area of research, so she said, do you want to join me in this talk? So I said, oh sure. So we were with some other people from New Mexico, there are all these fancy people in me, and I helped with this talk, and after I looked at her, I said, I don't do one thing that I just talked about. It was a very eye-opening moment for me because at that point I had at least heard about it, I hadn't been taught it, but I realized that it was not something that I valued at all. I understand it much better now. It's gonna prevent burnout, what they call compassion fatigue, all those things that can happen when you're working under the circumstances that I just mentioned and many of you are gonna walk into it and not well, I think you have to model self-care for your clients. Instead that's of true. you're not doing it. I think that's true. You need to lead by example. Lead by example. I think that's true. That's why you can have carrot cake like you. Want. <laughs> 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 you <laughs> so anything else? Does anyone want to say anything? Does anyone want the mic? Maida wants the mic. So that's it. 